Thanksgivings because our Thanksgiving consisted of eating a ham that was raised by my brother and sister-in-law. So they slaughtered the pig and roasted the ham and it was, it was mighty fine. It was mighty, mighty fine. So, yeah, we, they're not too big on turkey. Just, yeah. just throw it out there. I, mean, I like it in sandwiches, and that's about it. Um, I can go without it the rest of the year. Um, so we'll probably have him again for Christmas. That's what I can. This week we're going to start a series on sacrifice. It's going to take us right up to Christmas. We're going to talk about several stories of sacrifice in the Bible. Some of them are well known. Some of them may not be so well known. Um, but I'm, I'm really looking at some areas, even in the well-known stories. I, I, what God's been bringing to my attention are areas of the story, characters of the story where you don't normally think of when you read the stories. And so I hope to bring some light on the subject. It's hard sometimes when you start thinking about messages on such topics like sacrifice because immediately and inevitably the little hairs will stand on end yeah. and you know those people who sacrifice are they going to say I'm not sacrificing uh, you know and, and do they not know how much I sacrifice and you know the people who maybe don't sacrifice as much or at least it's not a visible sacrifice they feel like they're being talked down to or like you know well everybody has to give everything in order to be part of the church and be a good Christian you've got to give you know that's not my intent either of those are not my intent in these messages, and I don't think they're God's intent in these messages. I believe, honestly, the only thing that God is putting on my heart to do is to really bring out to light and display some of the aspects of sacrifice. Yeah. And to just highlight really what sacrifice is between now and Christmas. We know of Christmas is the beginning of an ultimate sacrifice. And it was the beginning of the sacrifice of Jesus as the Savior of the world. And that sacrifice actually started in heaven prior to Him coming to earth. And that was the sacrifice of the Father who gave His only begotten Son to come to this world to be a sacrifice. So yes, Jesus sacrificed in His life and death, but God ultimately sacrificed by giving His only begotten Son to come to this world and take our place on a cross for the salvation of mankind. And so from now till then, I want to look at sacrifice. The other reason why I think it's vital right now is we have a vision. We have a vision and a, and a, 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 a direction for harvest time that God has called us to. And that vision includes a, a campaign really, if you will, over the state of Wyoming. And it's a campaign of, of offensive strategy and, and moving into the realms of darkness and taking back land that darkness has stolen. And, and the only way that that's really going to get accomplished is if we continuously live a life of sacrifice and if we continuously decide day in and day out the call that God has placed on our lives, the vision that God has given us, not only individually, but corporately as a body of Christ here in Rollins, Wyoming, that call is worth my sacrifice. Yes. Today's message is going to be titled, Eric, oh. I always like, we, we have some title things, so... I'm just sharing the title. It is called A Legacy of Sacrifice. But before you can have a legacy of sacrifice, one generation has to consistently 
live in sacrificial obedience. Yes. Without sacrificial obedience, there will never be a legacy of sacrifice. <clears throat> if we want our children to live sacrificially, if we want them to raise their children sacrificially, if we want to see generation after generation after generation of individuals who would give their all to God, then it starts with us living a life of sacrificial obedience to God and doing it openly in front of our children, putting it on display in front of our children. No, we're not going and doing this. Why, Mom and Dad? Because, because this is us obeying the word that God has given us. Well, wouldn't this be more fun? Well, it might be, but we're sacrificing that to obey what God put in our hearts to do. Because that is what we are called to do. That is how we live and breathe and move. I mean, Jesus gave his all for us, so guess what? We as a family, we're going to give our all for him. And this starts a chain reaction of generations that live sacrificially. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 22. This is a pretty well-known story of sacrifice. It's probably the most well-known story of sacrifice outside of the death of Jesus. And it is Abraham when he offers up Isaac as a sacrifice. And if we start in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together, and Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar, and there... And Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. There's so much in this story in regards to sacrifice. First, if we are looking at Abraham and his sacrifice, you have to understand that Isaac is Abraham's only true heir. He had Ishmael through Hagar, but that was not to be his heir. That was, that was Abraham jumping ahead of the promise of God. That was him trying to figure out how to make the promise of God come to pass. Have any of you ever done that? Yeah. I'm guilty. God gave me a promise and I'm like, Woo, yes, hallelujah, amen. I love that word. And then my mind starts going about a million miles and I'm like, how is it going to come to pass? How can we make this happen? 
God promised finances. And next thing you know, I've got like 10 different plans on how to achieve financial success in the next two days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a problem solver. That's what I do. I just, my mind starts, I, sometimes I can't shut it down. And so Abraham gets the promise of a son. He gets the promise of this lineage that is going to be greater than the stars of heaven, that is going to be so great a number that you can't even count it. And through his lineage, there's going to be blessing that is poured out upon all mankind. And, and so here Abraham is, and, and he's an old man at this time, and he has one son. The reality of him having another son is... I mean, Isaac was a miracle to begin with because Sarah was past the point of actually being able to have children. Way past. Yeah. Menopause had happened a long time ago. Yeah. For her. <laughs> long time. And God made a way for the promise to come into the world, for the manifestation of of the promise of God, and here he says, Isaac, his one and only son, the promise, the one that through him, see, Abraham can now, at this point, look to God and say, yes, God, the prayers are answered. I can see that there could be a generation, that there could be a nation that, that, that multiplies and grows in number too much to be counted because I had one son. One promise. And from him would come more sons. From him would come grandchildren. From them would come more children and children. And this thing could exponentially grow. I can see the reality of the promise of God standing before me in one child. And now God says, take the promise that I have given to you. Take, not just take the promise. You understand what he's saying? He says, take the manifestation of the promise yes. and offer it up as a sacrifice. Yes. Would you be willing to lay the manifestation of your promise on the altar of sacrifice to the Lord? Yeah. A lot of times people say, oh yes, yes, I was sacrificing this God's, right? It came from God. I freely give it back to God. Yeah, right. And we do pretty good until we actually receive the promise. And then when we receive the promise, even some would dare to say, no, I would give it back to God if He required it of me. And then there comes a day where God says, okay, I require the promise back. We would say, okay, Lord, I'll give it back to you. I'll follow you in this. We would go on the journey. We may even gather the wood to burn it at the stake or at the, the altar. We may even take the trip three days to the mountain. And we might even start climbing the mountain. But somewhere in there, the majority of us would come to the place where we would say, Okay, God, you've seen my heart. Surely you're not going to require me to follow through with this to the full extent. Yeah. You know my heart. You saw I was willing to give it. And we call that a done deal. That's, that's yeah. enough sacrifice. Yeah. Well, I mean, God knows everything, right? God knows the intent of my heart. But what does the intent of your heart speak of you if you only get to the mountain and you stop at that point? See, the reality of sacrifice is that, that God oftentimes will not stop you yeah. until on the human level it's too late to turn back. Physically, Abraham was past the point of no return. In his heart, he was past the point of no return. Yeah. Isaac was bound to the altar. The wood was there. The fire was still burning, ready to light 
the logs on fire, the only thing left was to slay the sacrifice. And it said that the angel stopped him before, I mean, it says in this version that he was ready to slaughter his son. Determined within himself to see the thing through to its finality. Because that is what God had asked him to do. But God is my ministry. It's the manifestation of the promise that you've given me. It's my ministry. I can't lay it up on the altar. If I sacrifice it, then I'm giving up the promise that you gave me. God, it's my children. God, if I lay them... Just to be clear, we're not talking about child sacrifice here, right? Right? Okay. God, if I lay my children up on the altar, my promise, if, if I lay Noah up on the altar, my promise of a child that I waited nine years for, that people told me for nine years was going to happen, and it didn't happen, and I got angry at them. I, I, I got angry at people that kept telling me, you're going to have a kid, you're going to have a kid. We're not going to have a kid. It's been nine years since we've been married. We tried and we tried and we... It's not happening. Quit saying it. Getting mad at God. God, why, why are we... I look at other people that have kids and, and are we so deficient as parents that we don't get the right to raise a child but yet in this world you have kids being orphaned by their parents. Kids that parents that don't even want children and they go to abortion clinics. Where is the fairness in this? I'm just sharing my heart. And after nine years to have a son of promise come could I, could I lay him on the altar and say, God, he's yours. If you require him back from me, he's yours. God didn't stop Abraham until it was almost too late. Because until it's almost too late, the true intent of your heart has not manifested into reality. Sacrifice, true sacrifice, is when the true intent of your heart manifests in reality. Yeah. And you give. And you say it's yours. It's yours. But what about Isaac? We read this story and even the Bible later on will, in Hebrews will talk about Abraham's great faith and his ability to sacrifice Isaac. But what about Isaac? Do you realize that most scholars believe Isaac at this point in his life, is 30 years old. Think about it. It's one thing to have a little kid follow you blindly. Right? Yeah. I mean, Noah, right now, he would probably follow me blindly. Mm -hmm. If I said, hey, Noah, come on. We're going to go on a trip. Okay, Daddy. Here, Noah, carry some wood. Okay, Daddy. What you doing, Daddy? We're going to go do a sacrifice. Okay, Daddy. I mean, yeah. there's no reason to think anything other than what's being told. But a 30-year-old man going with his hundred and some year old father up a mountain for the purpose of sacrifice. Fully aware of what's supposed to be taking place. It's going to be a sacrifice. He's seeing the wood. He's seeing the fire. He's like, oh, where is it? 
Um, hey, Dad. Yeah, son. What's up? Um, we're going up for a sacrifice, right? Yep, 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 we are. So, usually, I mean, I see the wood and I see the fire. I mean, those are two components of sacrifice, but we're missing a key element. <laughs> I mean, there's usually an animal involved. I mean, something alive gets dead in a sacrifice. And where is the alive that is going to be dead, deaded? Dead? At the sacrifice. I'm not seeing it. I don't worry, son. God will provide. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you get up to the mountaintop. Now, Abraham's a pretty bad dude, right? If you read through the, the book, Abraham's not just some frail old, no. right? I mean, even in his old age, he went into battle. He right? Yeah. He, he's a tough guy, yeah. right? But I'm sure that Isaac at this point is no um, frail mama's boy. No. no. Isaac's probably, I mean, he's lived out in the wilderness, man, his whole life. Raised by a shepherd. By not just a shepherd, a warrior shepherd. Yeah. He probably knows how to fight really well at this point. He's probably pretty stout. I mean, 30 years old, you kind of wish I could be 30 again. It was only 10 years ago, but I wish I could be there again. You're, kind of, you're in your prime, right? Physically. There is no scriptural mention of how the actual binding right now. Mm -hmm. There is nothing in the book as to whether Isaac fought that or whether he willingly submitted to it. I don't know. I can't say for sure. Somehow or another, though, whether he fought it or he submitted to it, in my mind, I have to say he kind of at least had to submit to a point. Yes. Because a 30-year-old buck in his prime, not overcoming a 100, and, uh, at this time, 20, 130-year-old man. Yeah. 120, I think, somewhere around there. He's pretty old. Yeah. Somewhere, he willingly surrendered. To the binding. Yeah. He surrendered to the sacrifice that he wasn't even ordered to make. Because his dad was ordered to make it. Yeah. Yeah. This doesn't happen without a lifestyle of sacrificial obedience. Uh, it doesn't happen. No. They don't get to this point without that. Yeah. The only way Isaac ever, ever comes to the place where he allows himself to be bound for a sacrifice is if Abraham has effectively displayed a lifestyle of sacrificial obedience. Yes. To God. Yeah. Yeah. And through seeing time and time again that you sacrifice to obey and God provides. You sacrifice to obey and God provides. You sacrifice to obey and God provides. Time and time and time and time again. A lifestyle of sacrificial obedience and seeing God provide on the other side of that sacrificial obedience. 
I can believe too that in this moment, even though dad may have lost his marbles and he's tying me up for a sacrifice, if he said that God told him, I can look back on my father's life in my existence and I can see sacrifice to obedience leads to the provision of God. And furthermore, Dad told me God would provide Himself a sacrifice. God would do it. God would do it. Somewhere, somewhere, a legacy of sacrifice had been passed from one generation to the next. Ultimately, God does provide the sacrifice. And then... We, we have to look at Isaac's life after that. Does it continue to bear out in Isaac's life? Absolutely. See, after all of this went down, and Isaac actually ends up marrying Rebecca, he's getting ready to get his family and all of his flock and everything, and they were dead set on moving to Egypt. We're going to go to Egypt. And God stopped and spoke to Isaac. And he said, Isaac, do not go to Egypt. No. He said, I want you to go over here. Huh. Seems to me like a long time ago, God spoke to Isaac's dad. And he said, Abraham, his name was Abraham at the time, he said, Abram, I want you to leave the land of Ur and I want you to go to a land that I will show you. Yes. And Abraham immediately obeys. Packs his tent, packs his wife, packs his livestock, his everything, and heads out across the wilderness. That's where it started for him. And now it's Isaac's turn to stand in his father's place yeah. as the patriarch over the promise of a nation that will bless all nations. But in order for this to work, in order for this to take place, Isaac himself has to come to the place of sacrificial obedience. Yes. He has to sacrificially obey God. What was in Egypt, the center of the world at this time? The metropolis, yes. the shopping malls, the big city, Everything. all of the accommodations, right? I mean, they had Home Depot and the Nards and those all in the same place. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have Bill Bright, and that was it. So he goes to this land, Isaac goes to this land, he tries to succeed and he gets thwarted time and time and time again and finally he comes to a place where he digs a well and there's water in the well and it's finally a place where he can stay. And his remark is that, thank God we have finally been accepted in the land where God told us to dwell. Think about that. You go to a land where God tells you to dwell and it doesn't feel like you're accepted. So what are we going to do? We're moving. No, no, no. God didn't tell you to move. He told you to go there. But we haven't been accepted. So? Did God tell you to be there or not? Well, yeah, but... I mean, if God really wanted us here, then he, you know, he would have been, I mean, should have been some fanfare or something. 
Woohoo, they're here. Oh, oh, thank you. An answer to our prayers. No, God didn't. God maybe didn't send you to be the answer to their prayers. He just sent you because that's where He told you to go. So go where He tells you to go and stay there until He tells you to move. Yes. Some people spend their whole lives trying to figure that one out. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Abraham's legacy of sacrifice started with his sacrificial obedience. It cost him everything. But in the place where his sacrifice was about to cost him everything the Lord provided. In the place where it is about to cost you everything, the Lord will provide. Judges chapter 11. We have here another story of sacrifice. It's a tragic tale, but it's one worth mining out. Judges chapter 11 and verse 29. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead, and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites, I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Aror to the neighborhood of Meneth, twenty cities, and as far as Abel Karamim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home in Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity. I and my companions. So he said, Go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of the two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, for days, mm -hmm. four days in the year. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jephthah is not a very prominent figure in Scripture. He's mentioned a few times. He only, he was a judge over Israel and he only judged Israel for six years. That was it. And in the time that he was a judge, he, he was an outcast originally because he was the son of the harlot. His dad went and had relations with a prostitute and Jephthah was born. And his dad had many other sons. And 
his brothers actually cast him out of the house and out of the land because he was not born from their mother. He was born from a different woman. And so being an outcast, he, he lived for some time, and as he grew, God moved him into a position to become a judge over Israel and to actually fight the Ammonites that came in and were trying to destroy Israel. And he had great success. And in the middle of this campaign, he came to a place where he realized that he was coming up against one of the strongest battles with the Ammonites that he had ever faced. And in his desire to overcome the enemy, he cried out and made a vow to God. And his vow was simply, if I win, Lord, then when I return, the first thing that comes out of my house, I'll offer it up to you as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And so he goes on his campaign, and the Spirit of the Lord comes on him, and he just, great victory. But then he comes home, and the first thing that comes out of his house is his one and only daughter. And at this time, Jephthah's daughter was, of course, old enough to old enough to have been married and have children, but she was still a virgin. She had not yet had relations with any men, which means that she was old enough to understand. Again, not just a child blindly following. And Jephthah says something to her that's, that's remarkable, that, that I don't know that many in this day and age, in this culture in which we find ourselves, would actually be able to say. He said, daughter, he said, I, I've made a vow to God and I can't go back on my vow. <clears throat> Faced with the fact that this vow was going to cost him his only child's life. That it was going to require the ultimate sacrifice. He couldn't go back on his vow. Yeah. Right. To my shame, I can't begin to tell you how many vows I've made to God that I have not fulfilled. Most of them in the desperation of consequences that my sins have actually caused to come upon myself. And I said, God, if you only give me one more chance, I will not do what I'm about to say I'm going to do. <laughs> because that's how it came out. That's how it ended up in the end. And vow after vow after vow. But a man that was so honorable before the Lord that even when it cost him everything. He honored his vow. Yeah. But in his life, what needs to be known is that in his life, he created a legacy of sacrifice. See, this daughter that he had, for him to tell her, I came about a God daughter. And she said, Dad, Dad, it's okay. You fulfill your vow. You fulfill your vow. Do unto me whatever you have vowed, but you fulfill your vow. Wow. Wow. What kind of upbringing is? What kind of rearing of a child to get them to the place where they say, I don't care if it costs my life, Dad. You made a vow. You better keep it. 
I'm only going to ask one thing. I could, I could think, I could imagine in Jephthah's mind when she said, "All I have to ask is this one thing: let me go for two months." In his mind, I'm sure, playing over, there were times where he said, "Oh, please, just run away, just run away. Don't come back. Don't come back. Two months. Go into the mountains. Maybe." As horrible as it can seem, I'm sure the thoughts played in his mind, maybe have some other form of death take you to where it doesn't have to be by my hands. Don't come back to me after those two months. But he didn't say it. He let her go. And she was honorable enough that after two months, she came back. culture in America at this moment is one of entitlement. It's one of I deserve everything even though I've given nothing. What we see in these two stories between Isaac and Jephthah's daughter, they don't exist in our culture today. No. They might exist in individual places among a very small, small, small percentage oh. of the population. But as a whole, it doesn't exist. And we can blame society we can blame the children. We can blame television. We can blame we can blame everything except us as parents. But the reality of it is that it lies with us as parents. Because the only way the children grow up understanding sacrifice is if sacrifice has been modeled to them. And if it's been on display in front of them. Ultimately what happens is you have one generation who lives a lifestyle of sacrificial obedience and it passes down to the next generation. But a lot of times it stops there. Because the next generation sometimes will say, I don't want my children to suffer like I did. I don't want them to go without like I went without. I don't want them to deal with what I went through. And, and the problem with that is that somewhere along the line, a clear representation of sacrifice was failed to be made. Yes, they may have sacrificed. The reality of why some kids went without is because their parents had to sacrifice. But the reality of why those children, as now parents, refuse to let their kids go without is because their parents never taught them the value of sacrifice. And so in their minds, all they ever thought was, we just went without. And I will not do that to my children. But they never explained the purpose of going without. They never, they never made clear Sometimes we go without because we are sacrificing for our own. And sometimes we give rather than receive because we believe in the one who gave his all for us. Because sometimes God is requiring of us something and it is our place, it is our position as children of God, as heirs to the kingdom, to not get caught up in this temporal world, in the world in which we see, in the stuff by which we are surrounded. But it is our job to get caught up with the eternal hereafter and the rewards that God has put aside for those who faithfully serve and follow after Him. He who is last in this life will be first in the life to come. He who serves will lead. So I'm sacrificing now for a future glory. And somewhere 
in that sacrifice, that understanding was failed to be communicated. So the only thing a sacrifice becomes is my parents suffered. My parents suffered. They suffered in day in and day out. And what did it ever get them? It got them nothing. Not only did it get them nothing, it got us nothing. We suffered as a result of their suffering. And I'm not going to have my children ever suffer like they suffered. Like I suffered. truth of the matter is what was really going on is they were being sacrificially obedient to God but unfortunately they didn't communicate that clearly to their children and so all their children ever saw was suffering while the whole time their parents understood it was sacrificial obedience Our children are going to make it in this world. They need to understand yes. sacrificial yes. obedience. They need to understand why we sacrifice. Yeah, that's right. They need to understand that, you know what, son or daughter, when you make a vow to God, you better keep it. That regardless of what it costs you, I don't care what it costs. If it costs you your life, if it costs you your families, you keep your vow to God. Amen. Yes. Yes. If God asks of you something, you don't sit there and throw it back in His face like, I have the right. Some of our preaching of the Gospel has come down to what I have the right to have. And how dare God ask me to give up my rights? The God of the Bible asks every single person that ever followed Him to give up their rights. Yes, you have the right, but I'm asking you to give it up. I'm asking you to give it up. Why? Because Jesus gave it up. Jesus had the right. Jesus had the right more than you ever had. Matter of fact, you wouldn't have the right if it wasn't for Him. And he gave up his rights so that you could have rights. Amen. Now would you give up yours so somebody else can have some? Please. Would you sacrifice? Would you sacrifice? Sacrificial obedience. Will you leave a legacy of sacrifice to your children? Will they be able to look back on your life as their parents and say, you know what? Mom and Dad were never rich. Mom and Dad never had a lot. And they didn't suffer. But they sure sacrificed. And they clearly taught me the importance of sacrifice. And so even if I get a lot, and even if God blesses me with more than what my parents were blessed with, I hope, I pray, that I can live my life as sacrificially as they live theirs. Amen. What a legacy. What a legacy. What kind of legacy do you want to leave to your children? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? Do you want to leave them a legacy of, of entitlement? Of getting everything that they didn't work for, nothing that they deserved? That they have the right to be in every position over everybody else, ruling everybody else. Or do you want to leave a legacy of sacrifice and service? <clears throat> we got enough entitlement in the world. We don't need any more of it. We need some sacrifice. We need some service. If we just had a few, just a few in this world, that would live sacrificially obedient to God. It will change the landscape of this nation completely. So, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your word, Lord. And, Lord, as we continue to work through this series on sacrifice, I just pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see the truth of it. 
Lord, I know that men in here have, I would even say all in here, have at times given a great sacrifice. Lord, I pray that you would recall those moments back to them. And show them, Lord, in their heart, give the realization and the revelation that that sacrifice wasn't suffering. It wasn't suffering. It was sacrifice. And yes, it was hard. And yes, it may have been painful. But there's a difference between sacrifice and suffering. So, Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, Lord, that we would model sacrificial obedience to our children, to our families. And, Lord, a generation from now, we would have a legacy of sacrifice. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all of these people, Lord. Bless them, Lord, as they go from this place. Encourage them in their hearts. Lift them up for their day. We thank you for all you do. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Next week we'll be talking about the cost of sacrifice and looking at the widow's mind.